Well, hello, Nativity Bibleheads. It is Dr. Wayne, and this is your uh, Bible Study Wednesday. I hope everybody's doing well today. Um, we are going to go right to it. We're in the, uh, the book of 1 Kings. We are in chapter 11, and um, I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert. Chapter 11 is the last chapter about Solomon. Yeah. Um, uh, Solomon, uh, 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 you remember his, his daddy, his daddy was uh, David, right? And um, uh, we've had a lot of exposition from our narrator uh, in 1 Kings about how wise he was and how rich he was and everything. The pattern in 1 Kings is always to uh, flatter us with uh, like, you know, how great they were but you know in the end they end up going wrong and it's not always done in a uh, chronological order um, but it's done in a theological order so all of that good that we've seen about uh, Solomon thus far well in this chapter he go bad all right verse 11 or chapter 11 first Kings chapter 11 verse 1 King Solomon loved many foreign women. You already know right there, it's going wrong. Along with the daughter of Pharaoh, we were already told that he, uh, he married the daughter of uh, the Pharaoh of Egypt, right? Uh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. From the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the Israelites, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for they will surely incline your heart to follow their gods. Huh. So, um, Deuteronomy 17 was very explicit that this, that this is not proper behavior for a king. It's got to wonder. So, Solomon, he's supposed to be so wise, right? And rich, but yet uh, his downfall is, I don't know, how wise is it to do this, right? Um, Solomon clung, oh wait, 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 where did we finish? Uh, from the nation, you shall not enter the marriage with, with, for they shall, okay, I'm in the middle of verse two for they will surely incline your heart to follow their gods. This ultimately becomes the problem of all the kings, okay? In that they uh, let worship of other gods in. Solomon clung to these in love. So, um, we're going to get a few themes uh, established in this chapter. Like I said, it's the last chapter on, um, uh, on, on King Solomon, but um, we're gonna see some more themes. So one is royal apostasy. What is apostasy? Apostasy is when, you know, you leave the faith. And uh, royal apostasy is the kind of apostasy that the kings do, right? Well, this is the introduction of how that's going to go. All right, um, there's some other themes that are apparent, but I'm going to point those out as we reach them. All right, verse three. Among his wives were 700 princesses and 300 concubines. If you can add that up, that comes to a thousand. And he can truly say to any single one of them, you're one in a thousand. <laughs> Um, that's something my, uh, I don't know, was that my, uh, my Old Testament professor, I think, said that. And his wives turned away his heart, okay? Um, uh, there was a, a theme. Remember, who's the audience of this writing? The writing of this audience, or the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the audience, the, the readers of this book uh, are intended to be the exiles, after everything had gone wrong. And it is pointing out the error or folly in uh, going after 
foreign wives. Foreign wives basically means intermarrying. Any kind of intermarrying, somebody not in the faith, was highly, highly looked down upon, if not uh, ordered against. Um, and we're gonna see that once we get, I don't know, how many months or years it's gonna be before we get to Ezra and Nehemiah, but we'll see it there, specifically in Ezra. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah are books that deal with post-exilic Israel. Yeah, after they return from the exile and are actually back in the land of promise. Okay, very good. Verse four, for when Solomon was old, now this is something that our narrator likes to emphasize because um, David was fine until he got old. Well, yeah, not really, but um, there's, a, there's a lot of thing about, like when you get old, you kind of like lose your fire a little bit and that's what our narrator is uh, intimating here. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Again, our narrator is, uh, really uh, likes to um, refer back to David as like, yeah, that's when the kings were good, and yet we already saw David wasn't all that good. Um, yeah, he made mistakes and he came around, but you know, uh, was he good? I don't know. There's a lot of um, uh, glazing over the bad things that has uh, the reign of David be idealized. All right, verse five. First Kings chapter 11, verse five. For Solomon followed Astart, the goddess of the Sidonians, Astart, the Ast, okay, Astart, uh, it, it was one of those pagan religions that they would build these poles, okay, these, Ast, these Asherah poles, Astart poles, and very phallic symbol, um, and uh, it was one of those um, tempting religions because of the sexual nature of it all, and that uh, appealed to men, okay. Um, Anyway, Astart, uh, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. I think that's a good alliterative uh, use for a narrative, uh, for a narrator. The abomination of the Ammonites. Basically, foreign gods. We, we don't need to know anything more about Milcom. So Solomon did, verse 6, so Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not completely follow the Lord as his father David had done. Then, okay. As his father David had done, really? Now we know as the reader that David, he wasn't always on the, fat, uh, the right track, right? Yeah. Then Solomon built a high place. High place is a, um, a way of saying, you know, um, it's a worship place. It's an outdoor worship venue, if you will, for a foreign god. So Solomon did was the evil side, and he didn't, he built a he built a high place, verse seven, for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab. Now, uh, uh, Chemosh, uh, we heard about that. Did we hear about that earlier? No, we didn't. Um, but it's another one of those foreign gods. And for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites. Wait a second. The abomination of the Ammonites was Milcom in verse five, and now in verse seven, it's Molech. Molech is even worse than Milcom. Uh, Molech, uh, this was like a, a child sacrifice kind of a religion. Ugh. Okay, for Molech, the abomination of them on the, on the mountain east of Jerusalem, i.e. the Mount of Olives. Okay, so Solomon built a high place. He married foreign women. They turned his heart against the Lord. He built altars for their God. Gods, gods, okay. Verse eight, he did the same for all his foreign wives who offered incense and sacrifice to their gods. Did the same, what was that? Build the high places, places. To, so this is where, where a king can really mess up is uh, supporting the worship of other gods. This ultimately in the, uh, in the Deuteronomistic theology is the thing that the king can do that totally like, 
Okay, God says, no, we're not going to abide that. Verse 9, then the Lord was angry with Solomon. Yeah. Because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. And we, were, we heard the narratives of the Lord appearing to him twice. Verse 10, and had commanded him concerning this matter, that he should not follow other gods, but he did not observe what the Lord commanded. This is going to be the theme that continues throughout the book of Kings. Verse 11, therefore the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your mind and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes and I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. Do you remember that time when uh, Saul was king and uh, David um, tore a part of Saul's garment and, and it became like a, like a sign of, oh, just as this garment has been ripped from you, the kingdom will be ripped torn from your yada yada blah blah right well this is that uh, theme reasserting itself yet for the sake of your father david i will not do it in your lifetime oh oh well, that's interesting god is talking saying oh yeah i promised you yeah, so um i'm going to keep my promise to david but um i will tear it out of the hand of your son what is going on here okay Solomon is the last king of what we might call the United Kingdom of Israel, Judah, the whole nine yards. After, okay, and this is another spoiler alert. After Solomon, it divides up into the Northern Kingdom that's called Israel and the Southern Kingdom called Judah. Verse 13, I will not, however, God is still talking. I will not, however, tear away the entire kingdom I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. So he's telling Solomon, okay, your son is going to be a king, but it's not going to be over all Israel. Um, we're tearing those 10 away and we're giving you one tribe. Don't bet, don't, don't, don't get uh, caught up in the fact that, wait a second, 10 tribes, one tribe, 10 plus 11, 10 plus 11, 10 plus one equals 11. We're 12 tribes. Yes, there were. But here's the thing. Um, the tribes, uh, one of them got absorbed into Judah. It could have been Benjamin was a little one that was borderline there around Jerusalem. It could have been Simeon. Um, but um, there was this tradition of 12 tribes, yes. But the, when this, this rending happened, uh, it was the 10 tribes of the north. And... Um, and then of the two of the south, you know, Judah, Judah probably absorbed one or, uh, or the other, Benjamin or Simeon. We don't know for sure. But these were not problems for the original readers. These are only problems for us. Why? Because, well, we got, you know, the whole enlightenment behind us and, uh, you know, math. Okay, verse... Um, Verse 14, uh, we're in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 14. Then the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon. Okay, we're going to get three things here our, our narrator is going to point to. Three people, three, um, uh, yeah, three people who are going to be a little bit of a problem in Solomon's side. And they're going to be a, like a harbinger of things to come, okay? Verse 14, then the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, Hadad, the Edomite. Now, if you remember, uh, um, King David uh, had some problems with the Edomites. Were, what were Edomites? Edomites were people from Edom. Edom was um, that place on the other side of the Jordan, south of, um, south of um, the Dead Sea, on the, on the east side. And um, heir, um, descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother, Jacob's twin brother, and uh, they become kind of a, a bit of a thorn in the side. They already had been, and here they arise again. Hadad the Edomite, he was of the royal house of Edom. Verse 15, for when David was in Edom, and Joab, the commander of the army, went up to bury the dead. He killed every male in Edom. You can read all about that stuff in 2 Samuel. We, uh, we already covered it 
I don't have the exact reference, um, but um, the bottom line is, we already talked about this. Uh, this happened when uh, David was king. Um, verse 16, for Joab and all Israel remained there six months until they had eliminated every male in Edom. Verse 17, but Hadad fled to Egypt with some Edomites who were servants of his father. He was a young boy at the time. You know, fleeing to Egypt is a theme that like, continues in the Bible. I mean, fleeing to Egypt. Who fled to Egypt? Oh, uh, well, I'm not gonna get to go there first, but, uh, oh, that's my dryer. It's, it's warning me that things are dry, but um, I'm not gonna stop it, so it might go off again. I apologize. Um, so, um, fleeing to Egypt. Moses ended up fleeing, uh, Mo, Mo, uh, no, um, uh, Jacob ended up fleeing to Egypt when uh, he needed food. Um, remember in the New Testament, uh, Jesus' parents, Mary, Joseph, fled to Egypt. A lot of fleeing to Egypt. Fleeing to Egypt is a big theme in the Bible, okay? Um, uh, it was a young boy. That, uh, so, da, 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 but Hadad fled to Egypt with some Edomites who were servants of his father. He was a young boy at that time. They set out from Midian, Midian, oh, that reminds us of Moses, doesn't it? Yes. And came to Paran. They took people with them from Paran and came to Egypt, to Pharaoh, to, to, Pharaoh, to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who gave him a house, assigned him an allowance of food, and gave him land. Sounds a little bit like he was treating him like Moses, right? Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh. Oh, wait. Oh, Joseph. Joseph found favor in the sight of Pharaoh. Another biblical theme so that he gave him his sister-in-law for a wife, the sister of Queen Tapenis. Tapenis literally means wife of the king. <laughs> so to call her queen, wife of the king, not really her name, basically wife of the king, or the king, daughter of the king, something, something like that. I think I might have gotten that wrong. It's something of the king. Um, yeah, I'm not going to... I'm not going to look for it now. Oh, yeah, but it's something like that. It's not really a proper name. It really says, like, somebody who's related to the king. Sister of Queen, the, verse 20. The sister of Top, Topanes gave birth by him to his son, Genobah, whom Topanes weaned in Pharaoh's house. Sounds similar. Did not Moses get a wife from the Pharaoh's family as well? Genobah was in Pharaoh's house among the children of Pharaoh, just like Moses. When Hadad heard in Egypt that David slept with his ancestors, that means died, and that Joab, the commander of the army, was dead, we covered that in 2 Samuel, Hadad said to Pharaoh, let me depart that I may go to my own country. He's like, okay, I'm done here. I need to get back. But Pharaoh said to him, what do you lack with me? that you now seek to go to your own country. It's like, what? You got it good here. Why, why would you go? And he said, no, uh, do let me go. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 really. <laughs> Seriously, I got to go. I got to get back. Um, a little bit of Moses going on here, okay? A little bit of a themes of like Moses. So why, why, why is this something that's uh, being brought up? Because of the fact that um, one of the themes that our um, narrator is introducing here is that uh, the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is also Lord of all of history, all of the international history, even, even the treatment of other kings. Um, this, is going to, this is going to snowball into, um, uh, into later in the book of Kings when uh, Assyria takes over Israel, and then uh, Babylonia takes over Judah, and then um, Cyrus uh, takes over Babylonia and allows them to return. The theme of the Lord being the Lord of history, of all of international history, yeah, this is one of the things that our narrator introduces here. Another point, verse 23, 1 Kings 11, verse 23, God raised up Another adversary against Solomon, Rezan, son of Eliada, who had fled from his master, King Hadadezar of Zobah. 
He gathered followers around him and became leader of a marauding band after the slaughter by David. The, so we have David's name mentioned here, but we also hear this thing about gathering followers and being, becoming a leader of a marauding band. That's exactly what David had done already. He was like that. That's what a lot of first kings was about during the time of Saul's kingship. They went to Damascus, settled there, and made him king in Damascus. This king in Damascus eventually is going to become uh, the kingdom. Yeah, that's my dryer again, sorry. Um, I didn't want to go over there and turn it off. Um, and they went to Damascus, settled there, and made him king in Damascus. It's going to become the, the uh, Assyria, the king of Assyria. It's going to become the place of, uh, the kingdom of Assyria, which will eventually overtake uh, the northern kingdom Israel. But it's just referred to as Damascus right here. Verse 25, he was an adversary of Israel all the days of Solomon, making trouble as Hadad did. He despised Israel and reigned over Aram. I'm going to go shut up my dryer and I'll be uh, right back. All right. I hope you didn't miss me. I know you miss me. I know you miss me, blind. Okay. All right. Here we go. Um, back to chapter 11, verse 25. First Kings chapter 11, verse 25. He was an adversary of Israel all the days of Solomon, making trouble, as Hadad did. He despised Israel and reigned over Aram. Aram is a kingdom to the north. Um, it would eventually become, like I said, Assyria, Babylonia, all of those. Whenever we say north, it's actually due east, but uh, we say north because you had to, you went north to get there. Uh, but literally, it was due east. Um, verse 26 introduces a third nemesis. And this one is, and another spoiler alert, uh, the man who would become the king of the, the northern portion of the split kingdom. His name is Jeroboam. Don't confuse him with Rehoboam, which is Solomon's son, who will become the king of the southern kingdom, which is Judah. Jeroboam, that's who we're going to learn about now. He will become king of the northern kingdom, Israel, the ten tribes of the north. Verse 26, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, an Ephraimite of Zerada a servant of Solomon, whose mother name was Zarua, a widow, rebelled against the king. The following was the reason he rebelled against the king. Solomon built the millow. The millow is that, 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 uh, that fill-in dirt that comes when, uh, with the terracing. You know, to build a wall in a, in a place where it's hilly, you have to terrace it, and the millow is the, the, the fill-in that you do for the terracing and closed up the gap in the wall of the city of his father, David. Verse 28, the, uh, so, um, so the man Jeroboam was very able, verse 20, 28, and when Solomon saw that the young man was industrious, he gave him charge over all the forced labor. Forced labor is a euphemism for the slaves of the house of Joseph. And whenever we talk about the house of Joseph, we're talking about um, the, uh, the uh, tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. Those are the major um, tribal entities that made up the northern kingdom, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. So anytime we have reference to the house of Joseph, we're getting like the bulk of the northern kingdom uh, in that realm. About that time, when Jeroboam was leaving Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah, okay, okay, this is gonna introduce another of uh, our themes uh, that are going to continue in uh, 1 Kings. The prophet Ahijah, the, the Shilonite, found him on the road. Ahijah had clothed himself with a new garment. The two of them were alone in the open country. So do you get the picture? 
um, you've got Jeroboam and you've got this prophet Ahijah. When Ahijah laid hold, verse 30, when Ahijah laid hold of the new garment he was wearing and tore it into 12 pieces. 12, interesting. So prophets, this is where we see prophets beginning to um, act out their prophecies. Um, this is something that we're gonna see continued in other prophets, especially Jeremiah, oh my goodness, especially um, Hosea, uh, where they are, uh, the, the actions that they do are the prophecy. Um, get this, when Ahi verse, 11, uh, verse 30 again, when Ahijah laid hold of the new garment he was wearing and tore it into 12 pieces, verse 31. He then said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, see, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and I will give you 10 tribes. Remember what I told you already. Jeroboam will become king of the northern kingdom, the 10 northern tribes. Verse 32, one tribe will remain his. That's going to be Judah. One tribe will remain his for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. This is because he has forsaken me, worshiped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the Ammonites, and has not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and keeping my statutes and my ordinances as his father David did. So this is all the word of the Lord, Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom away from him, but will make him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, for whom I chose and who did, did keep my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom from his son and give it to you, that is, the 10 tribes. Okay, I wanted to get to the end of that sentence. Okay, here's where the other, another theme. Uh, did I mention the theme of uh, the, the prophetic word? Um, this is something that's gonna continue. Um, like what Ahijah did. Uh, another theme that we see here is that the promise to David uh, that, his, that there would be somebody on the throne, the fact that it would require actually the splitting of the kingdom because of uh, what Jeroboam did. God is see, being seen here still being faithful to his promise to David and his heirs and that there will always be a kingdom for him. It's not gonna be all Israel. The unconditional thing about the promise of God was Judah, the southern kingdom. The conditional promise was, you know what? If you mess up, you're not gonna be king over all Israel. And they were, and he wasn't, hence the split. But I will take the kingdom away from his son and give it to you, that is, the 10 tribes. So um, Jeroboam will become king of the northern kingdom of 10 tribes. Yet to his son, I will give one tribe that to my servant David um, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen to put my name. The Lord is still talking, saying, I'm going to do this. And at the end of the second book of Kings, this, the fulfillment of this promise is highly, highly in doubt, which is one of the reasons why when we pick up in Matthew in the New Testament with the promise of the Davidic heir coming in Jesus, it's like it actually finds fulfillment. It's really dicey at the end of the second Kings as to whether or not that's, that's fulfilled. But in the New Testament, we actually do find that fulfillment. Verse 37, I will take you, the Lord is still talking, I will take you, the Lord is still speaking, but he's speaking through the prophet Ahijah, okay? I will take you and, and the prophet Ahijah is talking to Jeroboam, remember? The cloak, 12 pieces on the road, open country. I will take you and you shall reign over all that your soul desires. You shall be king over Israel. Israel refers to the 10 northern kingdoms. Does not include uh, Judah. Verse 38. 
If you will listen to all that I command you, walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight by keeping my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did, I will be with you and will build you an enduring house as I built for David and I will give Israel to you. So we have a Davidic type of promise to Jeroboam. Um, and the, the Deuteronomistic language of, if you'll just be faithful, I'll be solid with you. And he continues to do that. The promise of, that the Lord makes to Jeroboam is very similar to the promise he made to David. Verse 39. For this reason, I will punish the descendants of David, but not forever. <laughs> See, this is, this is one of those things where um, uh, when, when the book of Kings closes with them in exile and there's not a king uh, and people are wondering, well, is this going to last forever? This is the way our narrator answers it, but not forever. Verse 40, Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam. See, Solomon, he's just gone off the deep end. He's old and a little bit cranky, right? But Jeroboam promptly fled to Egypt. What? Fled to Egypt? Yes. This is what you do, is you flee to Egypt for safety. Um, Mary and Joseph did it with Jesus, right? Um, long history of that. Long history of that in the Bible. To King Shishak of Egypt, by the way, King Shishak of Egypt, first Pharaoh ever actually listed, uh, named, if you will, in, in Scripture. Um, I know we think about Ramses and all that, but that's only because they built we weren't told that the, that the Pharaoh was named Ramses. We surmised it because that was one of the names of the supply cities that the, uh, that the, uh, Israel, the children of Israel were building. Anyway, King Shishak of Egypt and remained in Egypt until the death of Solomon. So he's kind of like in exile. He's kind of like the Lord has made him a promise that he was going to become a king. And in order to become king to save his life, he had to flee. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, that's something David did as well, did he not? David had to try to stay alive uh, in order to become king when Saul was uh, reigning. All right, now, uh, last uh, three verses here. Now, the rest of the acts of Solomon, all that he did, as well as his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the acts of Solomon? <laughs> I love this. It's as, it's as though a writer of, of, of scripture is saying, you know, um, here's the thing. I'm not trying to give you a complete list of everything that Solomon ever did. I'm giving you a theology around the things that he did. Now, if you want to read about all the other stuff, you know what? Here's a book you can go to. This is a hermeneutical key, this writing. This is one of those hermeneutical keys in the Old Testament that tells us that, um, that we don't have to get all hot and bothered about every single word and every single uh, pithy phrase in, in the Old Testament, in what we, the Hebrew Bible. Our narrator, our, our narrator even tells us right up front, you know, I'm not doing, I'm not giving you a complete history. History is not my bag. In fact, our narrator would say, and by the way, what's history? They didn't really know what history was. He's giving a theological accounting for what happened and why it happened. Verse 42, the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem was over all Israel was 40 years. The words all Israel refers to pre uh, pre-division southern and northern southern kingdom. 40 years, David reigned 40 years. It's a symbolic number, not to be taken literally. It doesn't add up if you really look at all the, the, the dates and stuff. But anytime you have that 40 number, it's like a, a nine, like it's a long time, it wasn't a short time, but it was a complete time, 40 years. Chapter, 40, or, uh, chapter 11, verse 43, last verse. Solomon slept with his ancestors. That's a euphemism for he died. And was buried in the city of his father David. And his son, Rehoboam, succeeded him. 
And that is where we finish tonight. And then we get into chapter 12 next week. So, um, uh, so one of the things that we saw in our uh, lesson today um, was these theological themes. Um, one is that uh, the, the theme of royal apostasy. The kings are gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna somehow tank it, okay? Number two, the prophetic word. Ahijah, the prophet, the prophetic action, the prophetic, he acted out something, gave him the word of the Lord. We're gonna see more of that. In fact, um, uh, later on, we're gonna start seeing where prophets are mentioned that, oh, well, maybe prophets should have their own books. Oh, so this is what eventually happens um, uh, with, uh, you know, when we have Isaiah and Jeremiah and, and Micah and Amos and Hosea and all of those. Um, the other theme that we saw introduced is God's control of international affairs. Now, um, God is uh, the Lord of history. This is an overall theme of the Bible. And we will see how God uses external forces, external armies, external leaders from outside to uh, effect his will on his people. And the fourth thing is, uh, the fourth theological theme that we see introduced here is the eternal promise to David. So even though the kingdom is not united, there is still, the, the promise to David is still fulfilled. He just doesn't get to be king over all of Israel, the Davidic heir, just Judah, just the one tribe, which had obviously absorbed either Benjamin or Simeon, something like that. Um, so um, we're gonna pick up there next week, uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, and um, uh, look for, uh, look for this kind of thing and uh, you know when we talk about the Lord being the Lord of history um, uh, what it means is uh, those things that we see in the world that think oh that ain't right you know what um, if our Lord is the Lord of history we've got to look for well how is the Lord using this how's the Lord using this how's the Lord using this um, when we ask those questions, we actually get on the side of the way biblical narration looks at life. And then we are challenged to then uh, conform our lives to the history that the Lord is uh, unveiling in front of us. Being on the side of history is being on the side of God, basically, is what our narrator, biblical narrators seem to be saying. So that is all we have for today. And... Um, so uh, blessings on everybody and peace.